Hi, and welcome to our read aloud with our novel, The Hidden, I always say The Hidden, it's Hidden Figures, and it is now on our day when we are going to read chapter six, and the title of the chapter is The Colored Computers. On our first day of work at Langley, Dorothy Vaughn spent the morning in the personnel department, filling out paperwork as part of her orientation. She held up her right hand and swore to the United States Civil Service Oath of Office. I, Dorothy Vaughn, do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. She took the pledge seriously. But it was her identification badge that made her feel like an official employee. The badge, a blue metal circle fe featuring an image of her face with the winged NACA logo on either side, granted her access to the various facilities at the Langley Laboratory. Since its establishment in 1917, the Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory's operation has been concentrated on the campus of Langley Field, an Army Air Corps base located on the eastern bank of Hampton's Back River. The service building where Dorothy went through orientation was one of the oldest buildings on the field. Year after year, the number of buildings had grown until the laboratory decided to expand to the area on the western side of the river. That land was still a forest when the construction began, and employees joked about having to work in such a remote area or place. The weekly Langley employee newsletter, newsletter Air Scoop, described it as a land of desolation, a land of marshes and mosquitoes. And here is a quick illustration of or caption of the area. After Dorothy finished the morning's paperwork, she boarded a campus shuttle bus that drove her to the end of a forested back road connecting the east side of the Langley campus with the west side. She looked around at the strange landscape of two-story brick offices and construction sites with half-finished buildings. Towering behind one of the buildings was a gigantic three-story high ribbed metal pipe it was part of a wind tunnel called the 16 foot high speed tunnel, which was used for experiments on airplanes. To make the scene even more unusual, all the buildings have been painted dark green to camouflage them against possible attacks from America's wartime enemies. The shuttle bus stopped to let Dorothy off at the front door of an office building called the warehouse building. She went inside and found rooms filled with desks arranged classroom style. There were office bright ceiling lights and narrow windows that looked over the construction going on outside. From inside the rooms, Dorothy heard a new unfamiliar sound. The steady beat of mechanical calculating machines so big they each took up an entire desktop. It was like listening to a parade of drums, each time a click when a number was entered, a drum beat when the operation's key was hit, and a full drum roll when the machine ran through a complex calculation. The same scene and the same sounds played in all the rooms where the women were working. Women were performing the same work at a similar place on the east side. The only difference between the east computers and the west computers was obvious. All of the women sitting in the desk in Dorothy's workspace were black. Take a seat. The room for the west area computing pool was set up for about 20 workers. As members of a pool, each woman had to be ready to work on any mathematical assignment that came through the door. Because the engineering problems that the Langley Laboratory worked on were so complex, 
the problems had to be broken down into smaller parts with each part assigned to a different woman. Dorothy Vaughn took a seat and the women welcomed her. Most had graduated from black colleges like Hampton Institute, the Virginia State College for Negroes, or Arkansas Art Agricultural Mechanical and Normal College. Many of the women had years of teaching experience. Others were starting their first jobs, just one out of college. Quite a few of the women belonged to the same civic organizations, churches, and Greek letter organizations, such as Alpha Kappa Alpha or Delta Sigma Theta. Dorothy realized that by working in Langley's West Computing section, she was in one of the world's most exclusive groups. In 1940, just 2% of all Black women earned a college degree. And 60% of those women became teachers, most in public elementary and high schools. At a time when just 10% of white women and not even a third of white men had earned college degrees. The West computers had found jobs at the single best and biggest aeronautical research complex in the world. At the front of the room, like teachers in a classroom, sat two white women, the West Computing section head and her assistant. The work that came to a particular section usually flowed from the top of the pyramid down Engineers came to head of the entire computing operation, who handed down tasks to each section head, who then divided up the work among the women in her section. Over time, some of the engineers developed favorites and brought assignments directly to the section head or even to a particular human computer. Dorothy was a welcome addition to the computer pool. The women had too much work to do in too little time. The National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics planned to double the size of Langley's West Area in the next three years. When Dorothy arrived, the agency was scrambling to keep up with the American aircraft industry, which had gone from the country's 43rd largest industry in 1938 to the world's number one in 1943. Trouble in the lunchroom. In the middle of the day, the women of West Computing walked as a group over to the cafeteria. Langley was so crowded that each team had a designated 30-minute window for lunch, just enough time for a quick meal and a little conversation. Most groups sat together out of habit. For Dorothy and the West Computers, segregated seating was required. The women of West Computing were the only black women professionals at the, lab at the laboratory. Not exactly excluded, but not quite included either. A white cardboard sign on a table in the back of the cafeteria said, Colored Computers, in crispy stenciled black letters. It was the only sign in the cafeteria. No other group needed assigned seating. The kind, this kind of racial insult was all too common. It was the kind of subtle jab that African Americans had learned to tolerate, if not accept. In order to function in their daily lives, the women probably expected it. But in the environment of the laboratory, a place that had chosen them for their mathematical talents, the sign seemed particularly offensive. At first, the women tried to ignore the sign. They pushed it aside and tried to pretend it wasn't there. In the office, the women felt equal, but in the cafeteria and the bathrooms, the colored signs were a reminder that some were more equal than others. A mathematician named Miriam Mann finally decided she didn't want to look at that cafeteria sign anymore. Not even five feet tall, her feet just grazing the floor when she sat down. 
Miriam had a huge personality. Dorothy and the other West computers watched as Miriam slipped the sign into her purse. Her small act of defiance made them all feel a bit, a bit anxious, but also empowered. But the next day, the sign reappeared. Miriam removed it again. This happened again and again for weeks. Sometimes the sign disappeared for a few days or a week, sometimes longer. But each time, it eventually replaced, it would be replaced with an identical twin. As the sign drama played itself out at the Langley cafeteria, an important civil rights case was playing out in the courts. Irene Morgan, an employee at the Baltimore-based aircraft manufacturer Glen L. Martin Company, worked on an airplane production line. In the summer of 1944, Morgan traveled on the Greyhound bus to her hometown in Gloucester County, Virginia, next door to Hampton. On the return trip, she was arrested because she refused to move to the back of the bus. The NAACP Legal Defense Fund defended Morgan, and in 1946, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Morgan versus Virginia that segregation on interstate buses was illegal. That what were the women at West Computing doing making such a fuss about a sign in the cafeteria? Outside Langley, serious civil right battles were being fought on the streets and in the courts. They're, they're going to fire you over that sign, Miriam, her husband said. But being black in America was a never-ending series of decisions about when to fight and when to let things go. Then they're just going to have to do it, Miriam said. Numbers are colorblind. Miriam and her husband lived near the Hampton Institute campus, not far from Dorothy, where Dorothy lived. Although the students were predominantly black, the school's president and many professors were white. Malcolm McLean, the head of the school, was determined that the school be committed to participation in the war effort. Under McLean's direction, the college established a U.S. Naval training school, effectively turning the campus into an active military base. Military police manned the campus entrances and patrolled the grounds. More than a thousand black naval recruits from around the country were sent to the school to learn how to repair airplane and boat engines. The school was also dedicated to providing, providing engineering science and war management training programs for people who wanted to work for the government and help America fight the war. As part of the program, men and women, including many of the women now working in the West Area Computing Office, crowded into Hampton Institute classrooms to learn everything from radio science to Hampton Institute, hosted in 1942. The college president told attendees that the war could be the greatest break in history for minority groups. Many local whites didn't approve of McLean's progressive ideas. They were particularly upset about how comfortable he was with socializing with black people as well as white people. In speeches, McLean urged administrators at white colleges to hire black professors. He entertained blacks and whites together in the president's residence. He even danced with a Hampton student at a school dance, causing a scandal. He believed in the double V. Victory in the war effort and victory in the front home front and wanted to help African Americans advance in American society. On the Langley campus, most of the engineers were conflicted on the issue of race mixing. They may not have thought about inviting their black colleagues to their homes for dinner, but at the office, they were friendly. The same attitude applied to women in the workplace. When there was so much work to be done, the engineers were open to giving a smart person, black or white, male or female, the chance to work hard and get the numbers right. The sisterhood. As far as the West computers were concerned, they assumed that they would have to prove themselves equal to or better than the white mathematicians. Because of the discrimination, they believed that African Americans needed to be twice as good to get half as far 
as their white counterparts. The West computers rejected all notions of being inferior because they were black or female. And they banded together like sisters to help each other at work. They double checked one another's work and policed each other to prevent tardiness, sloppy appearance, or the perception of bad behavior. They fought against negative stereotypes. They knew they stood for something bigger than themselves as individuals. Miriam Mann and the other women were no doubt delighted that at some point during the war, the colored computers sign disappeared from the cafeteria. The segregated office and separate bathrooms remained, but the battle of the West Area cafeteria was over. Even without the sign, the West computer still sat at the same table. Now, however, they were able to enjoy their lunch and eat in each other's company without staring at a humiliating sign. Many of the relationships that began in those early days in West Computing blossomed into lifetime friendships. Dorothy Vaughn, Miriam Mann, and the other women of West Computing became a sisterhood inside and outside of work. For ambitious for ambitious young women with mathematical minds, there wasn't a better job in the world. And we are finished with chapter six. And today, just like they were talking about that area with the wind tunnels, we will today have our first experience with our STEM activity while learning about the hidden figures. So thank you, hi, bye.